Well, in my line of business, you get to spend a lot of time ministering to the grieving. And often when someone passes away, we are accustomed to speaking of how they have gone to a better place. And that is true. That is true as far as it goes. But it doesn't go far enough. For you see, heaven is more than just a better place. More than just a place where there is no crying and no pain and no suffering. It is a place of unbroken communion, intimacy. First with God and then with each other. See, we are saved with everyone else who is saved. That's an old saying in the church. It's half of an old saying in the church. The other half goes, well, I'll say the whole thing together. We're saved with everyone else who is saved. The only thing you can do alone is go to hell. We're saved with everyone else who is saved. Do you know what the greatest fear in the modern world is? The most widespread anxiety? Even more than public speaking. <laughs> it's abandonment. Loneliness. A fear that we don't matter to someone else. We carry things like this around with us all day long so we can check up on our identity. What's going on on Facebook now? What did my friend have for, for breakfast this morning? We get on our list so we get our tweets and find out every little thing so we can check and make sure we are still who we are. I remember reading an article about someone who dropped, this was at the time, this was several years ago, they, it was the Blackberry was the big thing. And she dropped it and said, I wanted to cry. My whole life is in that thing. The greatest fear in the modern world is isolation, abandonment, loneliness. And God has given us an answer to that anxiety. He has given us to each other. He has brought us to himself. So the Christian life involves intimacy and fellowship, community with everyone who is following after Christ. Today we're going to talk about two aspects of that. These are the two marks of discipleship we're going to cover in this week's, as our sermon series continues. If we earnestly desire that life with God, a life in Christ, we should begin this life of solidarity with others right now and not merely wait for heaven to come and usher us into it. The first of these aspects of community Pastor Matt was talking about in the children's sermon, it's service to others. It's reaching out in love to someone. Help one another in love. Galatians 5.13 is our ARC Bible verse this month. But you probably know some others, right? Bear one another's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6.2 or probably the most famous summation of it in all of scripture from the prophet Micah he has told you O mortal what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God John 3.16 says as we all know that God so loved the world that he gave his only son but God continues to love the world and he plans to love the world through those who are so intimately connected with Jesus and see him as their head that they refer to themselves as his body. Pursuing justice and love is not optional for Christian disciples because it was not optional for our Lord and Savior. To pursue love and justice is participation in the life of Christ. And may I say in a, our particular cultural moment where we tend to make everything into a political issue, this is not primarily a call to political action. Jesus' command was that we love our neighbor, not love humanity. 
Certainly, we're called to love humanity too, but let me tell you, it's a lot easier to think I'm doing the right thing for humanity and still hate the guy who dumps leaves over my fence in October. Loving our neighbor is hard and particular, but it is what we are called to do to show God's character to the world. So we begin pursuing love and justice in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. Places that we can bring our passions and our skills and our interests and our abilities to bear. Whatever the daily walk of our lives is, we can start in that place with those people building healthy relationships, seeking reconciliation when there has been hurt, resolving conflicts, caring for others. These are things we can do no matter how much or how little political clout we have. We do this to emulate the Son of Man who told us in Matthew 20, 28, I came not to be served, but to serve. So Christians, the first aspect of being a life and community in Christ is to serve others. And the second is like it, only reversed. It's to be willing to receive the love that is given. Americans are not especially good at this, especially men. We like to pull ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps. But think about what a value a real friend is in this life. And amplify that by knowing that it's a spiritual friendship. Someone who will give you their love specifically to build you up in your relationship with God. All friends love and support us, but real friends also expect the best of us and, dare I say, even require it of us. They hold us accountable. Their love is unconditional, but their approval is not. A spiritual friend is for us not only a mirror, as James talks about in his reading today, but almost like a magic mirror that tells us not only what we are, but sees in us the best that we can be and calls us out to be that person. I was uh, talking with a friend one time on the phone and uh, let's just say the conversation got heated. It was on some personal issues. And the next time I t he hung up on me and uh, the next time uh, I, I spoke to him, he told me that his wife, who had only been hearing half of the conversation when he hung up on me, said, did you just end a friendship? He said, no. He just told me what I didn't want to hear. <laughs> and I needed to hear. <laughs> In one of her books, Jane Austen has one of her characters say to another after a particularly painful episode, say to her, it was badly done. Badly done. It's not pleasant for me to tell you these things, but I must tell you the truth while I still can. Proving myself your friend by the most faithful counsel and trusting that sometime you will do my faith in you greater justice than you do it now. Couldn't we all use a friend who could talk to us that way? So a spiritual friend is somebody who will hold you accountable. They will pray for you and they will pray with you. They will encourage you to a deeper faith, which will mean deeper repentance, deeper obedience, and deeper joy. They will reflect with you on where God is present and active in your life right now. See, spiritual growth occurs best in the context of deep interpersonal relationships, caring relationships between committed Christian disciples, which is why earnest disciples 
covet those kind of friendships. You can't covet your neighbor's spouse or their stuff, but you can covet their time and their love. It's a mirror. A person like that is a mirror who gives us an update on how we're doing prior to when Jesus returns again to judge the living and the dead. And they're just as for us as Jesus is. So the Christians have these kind of spiritual connections. We give love and service. We receive love and spiritual friendship. But we don't do this because we have to. It's not a new law. We do this because we get to. This is the privilege of following after Christ. The administrative assistant at one church that got very serious about living this way, um, they went through the transition on staff. They were being very intentional and making sure that people had spiritual friendships and they were reaching out and serving and doing all this stuff that was quite apart from the usual business of the church. And somebody said to this person, isn't that kind of legalistic? And she said, no, it's amazing. I'm going to go quote her. She says, I thought it was great. No one's ever cared about my spiritual life before. A pastor I know tells a story that illustrates this way we are bonded into a Christian community together wonderfully. When he was in seminary, um, the congregation he was attending endured a terrible tragedy. Um, an 11-year-old boy in the congregation was murdered. You could imagine what it did to this small Indiana town and to that congregation. Recounting the story 30 years later, the pastor said, I don't remember much of that sermon, but I remember the way he ended it. He talked about the footsteps poem. Do you know that, po that poem? Most of us have seen it on a greeting card or something. And he said, that poem, the problem with it is, is that it's not that it's wrong that God carries us when we can't care walk ourselves anymore. That is true. He said, but the poet used the wrong image because there is never a time when a Christian looks down the beach and sees only one set of footprints. Because the Lord calls all his saints in. The path of a Christian is crisscrossed with the footprints of hundreds and thousands and millions of others who have answered the call of Jesus Christ. Some of them we see and know. They sit in the pew next to us. They talk to us at coffee hour. They take us out for lunch or chat with us over the backyard fence. Some of them we know only by their prayers. That great cloud of witnesses that the author of Hebrews talks about, the, the saints who surround us and cheer us on as we run our earthly race. Though Jesus' footprints are largest, they are never the only ones. So the journey to heaven is one we take with everyone else who's going. Or we don't take it at all. So I say, if we would love, let our journey begin now. God has preserved us from loneliness and isolation and abandonment by connecting us with the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth, whom we get to care for and who get to care for us. And by doing that, he's teaching us to love. The way the Father loves the Son and the Spirit. The way the Son loves the Father and the Spirit. The way the Spirit loves the Father and the Son. Forever and giving without ceasing and unselflessly. Let us follow after Him and praise Him in that name. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.